Good morning, class, and welcome back to Viking Guitar University. As always, I'm your instructor, Viking Guitar, and today we're going to do another lesson on how to do home recording with Reaper. So, um, right off the bat, let me tell you, we're going to be doing some guitar stuff right now. I've got this patch set up through Podfarm. Podfarm just sends audio directly into Reaper. It's an amp preset uh, or an amp simulator, but we don't have to worry about that. Just know that that's how I'm getting my guitar sounds. So we're going to start by opening up Reaper right here and wait for the loading screen which is really aesthetically pleasing, and here we are in Reaper. Now, um, first thing we're going to do is uh, it opens up with a brand new project, so we're going to set a tempo by tapping on this here. So let's do it like a one, two, three, four, yeah, about 118. There we go. Now uh, what we're going to do is uh, make sure everything looks the way it should be, that we open up our audio configuration up here, and it is looking at the uh, tone port, which is the pod farm device, and it's ACO and all that's good, so okay. So we double click over here to create a new track. We're going to label this guitar one. We're going to scroll down just to make sure we're looking at everything here. We want the send one from pod farm, which I have set up to be the processed sound, not the dry sound. And we want to arm the track. Set up our metronome by clicking on it, right click on it, and turn the volume up to probably about 10. That's where I like it. And let's just listen to the tempo real quick. There, that's good. Now, what we're going to do today is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about um, what you do in a situation where you record a line, but uh, somewhere in the middle you make a mistake. Um, in uh, some older methods of recording, you would have to go back and record that take all the way from the beginning. But what we can do in more modern setups, like with Reaper, is something called punching in and out. And uh, we're going to start by recording a guitar line here, and I'm going to intentionally screw up at some point in the line, and then we're going to go back and fix that guy up. So uh, the track is armed. Um, it's reading the send one from uh, Pod Farm, and let me just play a bit to make sure that's going on. There we go. You can see the meters firing. So we're just going to hit record. I'm going to let it do two measures, and then I'm going to record a riff, and I'm going to intentionally mess up in the middle. Now, it's going to be a really simple riff, so here we go. So now we stop the recording. You can do that by clicking on the stop button or hitting space. We want it to, to save the riff. Now, as I'm sure you've noticed, there's a mistake in there. Um, we're going to hover our mouse over here and use our mouse wheel to increase this. And we're going to listen back through it. I'm just going to move the tempo to right before the start so we don't have to listen all the way through. And uh, we're going to find where that mistake is. So here we go. Okay, so I think it's right around here. Let's see. Yep, that's all bad. We don't want any of that. So what we're going to do in order to fix this part is we're going to go back a few measures and we're going to pick a starting point. We're, actually, let's just start from the beginning again and we'll, we'll stop it at a point that seems good for us. Now, before we do this and start clicking around, um, first off, I'm going to turn snapping on. So this means that when I click, it'll go to a grid point. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the part where it starts messing up right here. I'm going to click the cursor there, and if you hit the M button on your keyboard, it'll insert a marker there. And you can see that's number one. Now you can put markers wherever you want, and they will number themselves in the order that you place them. So you can put number two way over here to the right, and number six way to the left. And the cool thing about markers is as you hit those numbers on your keyboard, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, it'll just instantly move the cursor to those markers. Now, if you want to change one of these, you just click it and drag it to move it. You can hold Alt and click on it to get rid of it. And you can right click on it to edit it by adding a name and stuff like that. So we're going to remove all these except number one. And uh, one other, we're actually going to remove number one here too. We're going to remove it, but we're going to add it back. If you hold Shift when you hit M, it'll automatically bring up this little dialog box so you can type in the whatever comment you want there. So this is the this is the messed up bit. Hit enter and there you go. It says messed up bit right up here in the timeline. So listening through it, 
The, uh, it kind of does this riff in two different phrases where it does the first segment, which is fine, and then the second segment over here on the right where the problem is. So let's just put it about here and listen back. Okay, so if I click here and then I start recording, I know I have this much time before I um, want to start recording again. So just put your cursor there and uh, you're going to hit the record button. And then we're going to play through again, but we're going to play it right this time. Then hit stop, save it, and as you can see, we're going to zoom in here and we're going to get rid of this selected area by hitting escape. Um, you can see that it's got two things going on here. Now, the highlight part is the part it's going to play. So if we leave it on this lower part highlight and we start from the beginning, it sounds like this. It cuts out until the new recording part starts. Now, you might be asking yourself, if the messed up part is right here, why did I start playing back here? And the answer is, is that it's easier to splice in a new section if you start recording a bit beforehand. If you just jump in right here, if you have some timing issue or something like that, if there's any dead space between the two, it's going to sound weird. So I like to record a little bit before, usually a couple beats or a bar or something, or if I'm being really strict about it, the whole passage. So basically what we want to do is we want to set the point where we actually want this to split between the two tracks, where we want it to go from this old track here to the new part. So what I'm going to do is turn snapping off because I don't want this going to the grid here. And we're going to zoom in on this super finite. A good way to try and do this to make it more transparent is to find a part where your playing really matches up between the two takes. Now, I haven't been paying super strict attention to the rhythm here, and as you can see, my downbeats are not exactly mechanically on the beat, but that's fine. Um, however, what you can see is that right here would probably be a bad place to splice it because they don't line up too much. This would be a slightly better place to splice it because they're closer, but this right here would be very close. So what we're going to do is we're going to select a point and I usually like to pick something kind of right before uh, a downbeat or a heavy beat because it, it just makes it a bit less uh, obvious when you do your actual splice. So you're going to put your mouse there, um, or your cursor, click on the spot you want, and then right click, and you're going to go down to split items at cursor. Now you can also do this just by hitting the S button, but when you do that, it's going to split this into two different parts. So now what we have the option to do is have it play this top part here and then switch into the bottom part. Now, when I recorded the second take, I just finished out the riff, but let's say I hadn't finished out the riff. If I had only recorded over the bad part here, and then I needed to jump back in up here, we could do the same thing by going to a point where we want to do the split, like here, hit S to cut it in half, and then just select the top part there. Now what it's going to do when we play it through is it's going to play all this part here, when it gets to this split, it'll play this lower part. When we get to this split, it'll play this upper part. So let's listen through it before playing all the old stuff. And now, when we're selecting the new segment that we've cut from our second take. It's essentially seamless. Now, the one thing you might notice here is that when you do your splits, if you're really paying attention, you'll notice it automatically adds this little tenth of a second crossfade. Now, this is a personal preference thing, but if I'm switching between takes, I like to leave that little crossfade segment um, because I think it just blends the two well together. Um, there is a moment in time where it drops the volume entirely, but I think it's sometimes smoother than if it just cuts across, where you might hear an audible click. However, the problem we end up with is that back here, where we started recording the take, it does that same crossfade, and if we listen through this without the metronome, we might hear a slight momentary drop in volume here. It's almost imperceptible, but you'll hear a slight click right there. I don't like that. So what you can do is zoom in, 
If you want to get rid of this, just grab this line over here, click it, and drag it back so it's zero. Click it, drag it back, and it's zero. Another way you could do it is if you want to click on the item and right-click, go to Item Properties, or hit the F2 button, it'll bring up this dialog box here. And you can manually set the fade-in and fade-out length for the track. Now, when you create a track, Reaper almost always automatically puts a tenth of a second fade in and fade out, and that's usually fine. But if you want to set it to something else, just punch in that number here, hit the OK button, and it'll do it that way. So now what we've done is we've recorded our first take. We chose a point to record a second take, recorded the part we want, then cut it so it fits in nicely with the others, and now we uh, adjusted the crossfading so there's no clicks. Now, the one last thing you might want to do is clean this up a bit more. The, the nice thing about having it this way is you can do as many takes as you want, cut it up the way you need, and then select the good bits. But the problem is, is that you start getting all of these stacked layers. And I've had times where I've had like, you know, literally 18 or 19 stacks of if I'm trying to do a rough solo or something. So what we can do if we want to get rid of all this and just make it one continuous file is click on the first part, hold shift, go over until the last part and click there so it highlights the whole thing. Now if we right click on the file and go down to glue items, what it'll do is it'll rebuild it together into one, one audio take right here with no spots or anything. Now keep in mind it'll preserve all your crossfades, so if you leave your crossfades the way they are, it'll interpret that when it makes this item. Just keep that in mind. If you don't like it, just hit Control Z or go to the undo button and it'll bring it back this way. So we're going to redo it right here. Now the last thing we're going to do with this individual file is we're going to go to the beginning and we're going to turn uh, snappings back on. So we're going to go one beat before, hit the S button to cut off the beginning and select it, hit delete, and then select a part at the end, hit S to split it, hit delete on that part, and now we just have our individual file without any noise at the beginning or the end. If you wanted to be a real stickler, you could turn snapping off and go in and really minutely cut it there do a little bit of a fade so it's not an audible silence to sound and do it that way, but we're not going to worry about that. So what we've learned to do so far in this lesson is um, record additional takes, splice between them, deal with the crossfades, add uh, markers, and add markers with comments. Now there's one other thing we're going to talk about, and uh, this is kind of an interesting thing, but first off what we're going to do is we're going to go move this file back, so uh, actually we're going to turn snapping on first and then move it back so it starts at the second beat, just because I don't like having all that dead space. Now, let's say that this song right now is at 118 beats per minute, and it sounds like this tempo. That's great. Now, what we want to do is, uh, let's say that we have another part later on in the song that we want to have jump up to, say, 140 beats per minute. That's really easy to do. All we want to do is put our marker at the place where we want the tempo to change, and hold shift and hit C. That'll bring up an insert time signature marker dialog box where you just enter the new tempo. So in this instance, let's say 145, it'll show the position you're putting it at and you can manually change that there. You can set it to gradually transition from the prior tempo to the new tempo and you can set a new time signature. So let's just punch this in here. And when I hit okay, I want you to pay strict attention to what happens to this media item right here, this guitar line. Now, as we listen to this guy, uh, let's uh, move it over here actually. As we shift it over, it starts stretching this file. And as you can see down here, this rate comes up. This means that it's adjusting the speed of this guitar line to match this new tempo. So as we listen to it before, it sounds like this. But let's stretch it over here by moving this tempo thing there. Now it sounds like. You hear how it's sped up? That could be a good or a bad thing depending on what you want. But generally, if you're doing a hard time shift later in the song, like going from 118 beats per minute all here to 145 beats per minute here, or somewhere in the middle, um, you want to make sure that it doesn't change the earlier parts. A good example of this would be if you had the drum line set up for a whole song and then you recorded a guitar line over it, but then added a tempo change. So a way to avoid it stretching like that is to right click on the track, go down to set track time base and set it to time. Normally it's set to project time base, which means it'll follow those BPM changes. But if you set it to time, now when we move this across, 
it doesn't stretch the file. It'll stretch the grid lines, but the actual guitar line will sound the same. It's an important thing to know because sometimes you, uh, you want to add a segment in with a BPM change and you've already recorded your guitar, your vocals or something, and all of a sudden stuff starts sounding out of time and you don't know why. If that's ever happening, just go down to set track time base, make sure it's set to time. And then as always, what we can do is we can go and save the project. Um, we can go to file, we can render it to render it to an MP3 or a WAV file or something that we want to share with friends. And uh, then we can feel like awesome musicians that have the entire world at our fingertips. And that's the whole point of this. So let's close this out. And thank you for watching. Um, as always, I'm Viking Guitar. If you want to see more of these lessons, you can go to www.vikingguitaruniversity.com. And until next time, keep the world metal.